and seminars. And uh, we are fortunate once again this semester to ha have another accomplished professor from Texas Austin. <laughs> Last semester we had Professor Ori Zornberg, this semester Professor Eric Mason, uh, who's working directly in our area uh, in transportation and on asphalt materials. Actually, uh, he's uh, one of our um, very well-known professors, a uh, PhD student from A&M. Uh, Dr. Amit Bazin did this PhD work with Professor Dallas Little, a uh, good friend of ours, and, uh, and actually it was primarily on the surface energy uh, methods, so uh, he knows quite a bit about the asphalt, the binder chemistry, and uh, actually that's pretty much what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, we will learn from him on understanding the asphalt genome of, to engineer better asphalt binders. As I understand, this is part of an NSF project as well as an applied end to it. And so basically, you'll be look forward to hearing that and learning from you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike. Well, thank you all for being here this afternoon. And thank you very much for inviting me to be here and talk for a few minutes about uh, some of the things that uh, I'm working on with a number of distinguished colleagues from uh, not just the U.S., but uh, all across the world, I'd say. And as a part of uh, the, the abstract here, I had um, a, a caption that said, uh, asphalt binder is really the billion dollar glue that's holding trillions of dollars of worth of assets together. Uh, and it is, it is such an important component of our national infrastructure system. So I believe all of you are familiar with asphalt mixtures uh, and materials. And if you look at a pavement structure and you go down and look at the asphalt mixture that is used to build the structure and further look down into this asphalt mixture, you'll see that the glue, the asphalt binder, is the most essential component that's actually holding all of this together. Uh, <clears throat> by weight, it is about 5% typically but by cost, it is 50% of the, roughly 50% of the cost of the mixture. Uh, also, if you think about it, it is by far the only material that you can play with, that you can engineer, that you can tweak its properties. Asphalt binder is the flexible stuff in a flexible pavement. That's what makes a pavement flexible pavement. Uh, so what the title of my presentation is Understanding the Asphalt Genome to Engineer Better Asphalt Binders. But before I start, let me sort of give a disclaimer here in case uh, any of you here or those listening to the broadcast, uh, that I'm not a chemist. When I am uh, a civil engineer by training, I started in my graduate school working on a project related to uh, the adhesion of asphalt binders and aggregates. And as a part of that uh, <clears throat> project, uh, we had to understand the physical chemical processes or the, the fundamentals of adhesion of why two things stick to each other. And uh, my advisor, Professor Dallas Riddle, said, OK, if you need to understand this stuff better, uh, you need to understand a little bit about asphalt chemistry. So he was very happy to ship me off in uh, a nice winter month to Wyoming uh, to our colleagues in uh, Western Research Institute. Now, Western Research Institute was, was full of chemists, chemists that uh, particularly there's an entire group devoted to asphalt chemistry. So I spent quite a bit of time with them. Um, understanding, learning the fundamentals of asphalt. I don't claim to be an asphalt chemist, but what I try to do is to learn uh, what is relevant and bring it back to the engineering domain, to the engineering business, and see how we can literally engineer a material. If you think about it, uh, materials is a very exciting area. Uh, this is where in the next decade, two decades, or even five decades looking forward, this is where the revolutions are going to take place. This is where this is the most exciting area, and it's not just asphalt; it's across the board. For example, if you just want to think about it, just look at uh, uh, <clears throat> the Boeing Dreamliner. You know, if you look at the Boeing Dreamliner, which is the newest aircraft claimed by Boeing, just so fuel efficient and and can seat much many more people, so on and so forth. One of the biggest breakthroughs in, or the reason why they're able to build that aircraft is and make it so efficient uh, is that not because they have a new revolution in understanding the aerodynamics or turbine engines or anything. It was because they were able to design, engineer, 
lighter materials with higher performance, better materials. The revolution came from the material side of the business, uh, not from the other side. And that's just one example. Uh, it's the same with the asphalt industry, is that our roads look the same, but there is a lot of potential, there's a lot of opportunity for us to tweak and play with this glue and engineer it just a little bit. And, and the scales of these kind of innovations are huge. If you think about companies such as Honeywell Polymer, Dow Chemical, uh, BASF, uh, Creton Polymers, these are huge multinational companies investing millions of dollars in R&D to develop a product that goes in only by one or two percentage by weight of the bitumen. So can you imagine the, the scales of operations that we are talking about? So getting back to my topic here, what I wanted to do today is sort of, this is sort of uh, a compilation of uh, several different research ideas, research projects and activities going on uh, within my lab and with, through my associations with uh, distinguished colleagues all across the world. And I want to put all of that together into this idea. This, this idea here is, is not a research project, it's not a funded project, it's just an idea. It's an idea what it says is that this glue that we are dealing with, this asphalt binder that we are dealing with, is not produced like cement or steel. You can go to a steel refiner, you can say, put 98% iron, put 1% carbon, put this much vanadium nickel, and you get a steel with this tensile strength. We don't do that with bitumen. Mother Nature throws at us crude oil, we process it, and what is left behind is what we use to build a million dollar structure. And we are all the time trying to make sure whether it's going to work or not. So uh, uh, because Mother Nature is producing this for us, uh, this material inherently has a lot of variability. Its chemical nature, its chemical composition changes very much depending on which, what the crude oil was, where it comes from, how the refinery has processed it, how post-processed it and blended it with other refineries or uh, stocks from other refineries, so on and so forth. So we're dealing with the material that we don't produce. Think about steel. Steel we can produce. We know exactly the chemical composition. But here we're dealing with a material that we do not produce. Nature produces for us. And if you're going to take something that nature is throwing at us and engineer a product out of it, we better fully understand what it is, what it is made of, and what implications it has. The whole idea of genome is because there is so much variety in what nature throws at us that unless we fully map or understand how this variety translates into performance, this would be a, a difficult task. So how, if you take the question is how do we engineer better binders? Okay, if I say, okay, let's now make this binder, this glue, a little bit better or a lot more better than what it is today. If I take that and break it down into two, I can break it down into two questions. First of all, how do I know that X binder is better than Y binder? How do I know that A is better than B and so on and so forth? And the second question is, once I know that A is better than B, how do I design a binder? How do I engineer a material from bottom up that makes it a better binder? So this is a famous adage. I couldn't find who to attribute to this particular phrase to, but it's quite old. And what it says is that you cannot control or improve what you cannot measure. And that's a lot of what we do in the asphalt research is, is exactly that. Measure performance, measure um, either engineering properties, uh, and we do it not for the sake of measuring or designing, but we also do it to understand this material better, to make it so that once we measure it, we can make it better. So the first step is, is measuring, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I'll just throw a couple of examples and move on to the second question here, is how do we design a better binder and <clears throat> spend a little bit more time on the second question. So again, if you think about it, how do you measure performance? We are all very familiar with the typical modes of failures in an asphalt mixture. You have rutting, fatigue, cracking, thermal cracking, and so on and so forth. And of these, my favorites I've picked are fatigue cracking and thermal cracking. And the reason why I've, I'll pick on these two, and, and currently I'm picking on these two, is because <clears throat> if you think about uh, the contribution of binder to these three components, uh, binder is... Uh, is very much responsible for these two uh, and is only partially responsible for rutting because if you think of plastic deformation in an asphalt mixture, the aggregate structure, the aggregate skeleton has a lot to do with it. So uh, binder has two, but uh, it's, it's an interplay between aggregate and binder. In terms of fatigue and thermal cracking, 
Again, aggregate structure plays a role, but it is at the end of the day, it is the binder that has to take the responsibility to resist those tensile stresses, if you will, in a very simplistic fashion. Uh, the same goes for thermal cracking, is that ultimately binder is the material in an asphalt mixture that will relax and relieve those stresses when you have a nice cold weather uh, outside and the temperatures are dropping. I'm sorry, in Illinois, you don't say nice cold weather. You, have, you say severe <laughs> cold weather. So in Texas, if it's cold, you say nice cold weather. So, uh, but if you have an extreme cold weather outside, uh, the material is shrinking or trying to shrink. It's building up these thermal stresses. And it is ultimately the binder that has to relax and relieve those stresses. Because if it cannot do that fast enough, the stress buildup will be so high that it's going to crack. Okay? So that's, again, why binder is more responsible uh, in these two areas. So, and there are, there are techniques that we use, uh, a couple of examples here that we use uh, to measure these kind of properties. One is uh, uh, a test on asphalt mortars. Uh, there are, uh, mortar is not the full asphalt mixture. It's not the binder. It is something in between. Uh, it is a composite of fine aggregates and the asphalt binder. <clears throat> uh, this is a good length scale because it is more efficient to test and evaluate takes the aggregate out of the picture. Uh, yeah. And there's another variation of this same where we use glass beads or, or a, an aggradation of different glass beads because if you're interested in filler binder interaction, this is a good system to have. If you're not interested in the filler binder interaction, you just want to look at the binder performance, uh, you can stick to this kind of system. Uh, so there are, there are experimental methods to do that. Uh, there are models, we've looked at several models, including continuum damage models that can very easily be applied to this kind of system to characterize fatigue, healing, uh, so on and so forth. Um, another approach is, uh, is what we call as a poker chip test. Uh, poker chip test is basically uh, a sandwich, a thin film of asphalt binder sandwiched between two rigid plates here, uh, and you can do this uh, tra in transverse mode, you do this tensile test. Both of these tests what uh, they try to do here is to test the binder by subjecting it to a stress state that is more realistic in terms of what the binder would see in an asphalt mixture. Okay, that's the whole idea. We're not testing a large blob of asphalt primarily because a large blob of asphalt does not exist in, a, in an asphalt mixture. What exists is binder that is confined, experiences very high confining stresses because of the rigid aggregate particles surrounding it. So you take that and you sort of recreate that in a more controlled fashion by either putting it in the form of a composite or by putting it in this kind of a, a geometry here. <clears throat> so these are just some of the techniques that are we, we're using to address the first question and, and we're sort of also developing them as we go along. Uh, just to give you a, an example of how uh, some of these things are being used, this is a, a result from using the glass bead composite. There, each one of these pairs represents a b different binder. And these binders are interesting because all four of these binders are exactly the same true continuous grade within half a degree to one degree. So I forget the exact grade, but if they are all high on the high side, they're all 67 plus or minus half a degree. On the low side, they're all negative 25 plus or minus half a degree. So they are not the same grade. They are very similar continuous grade, so that close to each other. They, all these binders are from the same crude stock, same refinery, same source, but they've just been modified using different polymers in different proportions. And as a result of that, you get very different performance characteristics. So if you go by the binder spec, all of these binders should be exactly the same, but they are definitely not. So you'd see that in this case, these binders have a very different, so what you see on this axis here is a fatigue life, um, again, it, under one condition, um, the way these have been analyzed is that you can get these answers for any random condition, but in this case, we're just applying one condition and predicting the fatigue life. Um, so you'd see that uh, these, you have very different performance characteristics for these four binders. But what you also see is what the point that I'm trying to make here, what you also see is that the bars on the right correspond to full mixture tests using a push-pull type system with viscoelastic continuum damage uh, using an uh, asphalt material performance test and AMPT type of design uh, device. So you'd have to fabricate full asphalt mixtures in using super paved gyratory compactors. You'd have to glue the end plates and run all of this test on full asphalt mixtures. And on the left side, what you see are results from this device 
using uh, samples that are about this much in size. Uh, and literally, the preparation of all of this, my goal is by the end of 2015 to consolidate all that uh, set up to no more than the size of this desk here. So we have a little mixer, a little press, a little compactor, a little specimen fabricator, everything over here. Just because I know aggregates are important, I know mixture is important, that's what the ultimate goal is. But if I'm interested in the binder, if binder is my question, if things like additive effects, if things like aging, if those are the issues that I'm interested in, then I can save a lot of time instead of producing mixture after mixture, I can save a lot of time by running these kind of tests. And once I have uh, a finalist or if I want to do some validation, then I can do a few mixture tests at the end. So it's just about efficiency. <clears throat> so we're using this and other kinds of tools. I, I'll not talk about poker chip now. I'll talk about poker chip tests a little bit later and show how we use it. But we have these kind of ideas and systems to address uh, the first question, that is, how do we know an asphalt binder is better? So these are some of the tools that we're using to evaluate binders. So the second question, which is really the heart of all of this discussion, is how do you design an asphalt binder? How do you, how do you design to be better? So this was the starting roadmap, if you will, uh, for, for us to understand how to make it better. We started with that this, this question here. We know that the chemical composition of the asphalt binder is very important. And chemical composition is changing all the time because you're dealing with, even for the same grade, you're dealing with different producers who are getting crude oil from different sources, blending those crude stocks. Then you have um, people who are adding polymers, plastomers, elastomers after the binder production. Then you have people who are adding other things like liquid anti-strip agent at the construction site uh, or maybe a warm mix additive, uh, people who are adding recycled rejuvenators, recycled asphalt and all kinds of other issues. So you are all the time you're changing the chemistry, right? So this is what is on the production side of the thing. The binder producer, the contractor, the uh, construction, they are all messing with the chemistry of the asphalt binder. The end product as engineers, we want a good pavement. So we are worried about, okay, what is the stiffness? So in binder, I'm just talking about rheology, but basically it boils down to stiffness. What is the stiffness of this material? What is the strength of this material? What is the tensile strength? Because that is tied to things like fatigue, cracking, and so forth. Right? So this is the output side of the equation. We are interested in having a material with well-defined stiffness, well-defined strength. And on the input side, we are changing the chemistry of this material, uh, whether we realize it or not, or whether we consciously do this or not, but we're doing this. All this is changing all the time. So this is an input variable that's changing. And this is our desired output which is more or less constant for a given set of conditions. So the pathway is we, we want to discover how do we get from here to here and how do we get from here to here. Now in this pathway I will throw in another interesting caveat here is that microstructure becomes important. In fact, in just in the last few weeks alone uh, we have seen enough evidence to actually put microstructure here as well. Uh, but that's still work in progress. We'll, we'll get to that as uh, with in time. But for now, we think that in terms of stiffness, uh, the chemical composition, we, we are trying to find what is this connection. And we're also trying to find the connection between the chemistry and the tensile strength via understanding the microstructure. Okay? So that's, that's the pathway. In, along each one of these paths, we are, we are trying to use uh, modeling methods, um, the theoretical methods, or uh, simulations. And we are also trying to use uh, experimental methods because it's the pairing of a good experimental work with a good theoretical work that is very important. Uh, I can sit on my desk and do theoretical model after another uh, for years and that does not have any bearing. I can go to the lab and do experiments after experiments. That is not going to uh, give me as much information uh, either. What really works best is when you combine the two, when you balance or when you do this correct balancing and optimization between getting uh, using some theoretical work and balancing it with some experimental work. The same philosophy, different tools here. So here the tools are we are working with composite models. The experimental tool is a shear rheometer. In this case, the modeling, uh, the tool, the theoretical tool that we are using is uh, something called as phase field modeling. Uh, this is something that has been used in metallurgy and polymer sciences. Uh, we are now applying it to asphalt. Uh, and the experimental tools, in terms of experimental tools, we are using the atomic force microscopy. And then 
to connect, go from microstructure to strength, we are using, as far as models are concerned, we are using something like very similar, uh, very uh, commonly, uh, we are all familiar with, with something like finite element method. And in terms of experiments, we are using <coughs> tools such as the atomic force microscope again, and uh, direct tension measurement devices. Okay. So uh, let's start the story. So let's start, start the story of discovery on, on each one of these. I'm going to spend a few minutes on each one of these blocks telling where we are in this journey to figure out the connection between chemistry and rheology, chemistry and tensile strength. And as we start this journey, I will start first with the materials that we created to take us on this journey. Okay. So we wanted a special set of materials instead of going out and finding materials, um, you know, getting different binders from different sources. That would be very nice. It would be very real. But instead of doing that, we decided we'll produce our own binders that have very well-defined chemistry. We control exactly what we want. So to start this journey, we needed materials. We created, we started with two unmodified asphalt binders, at least unmodified as far as we know. The refiners never always produces, don't always tell you. So it could have some weird things in there. Uh, <clears throat> what we do next is we separate each one of these two binders based on their polarity. Now, if you're familiar with binder uh, or binder uh, chemistry a little bit, you have typically asphalt binders can be separated or you can classify all the molecules. So think of an asphalt binder. It's a dead dinosaur, right? Millions of years ago, there was a dead dinosaur or something like that or a, or a plant that decomposed, became crude oil. The crude oil went to a refinery. The gasoline came out. Kerosene came out. All of these are nice, high-value products, very well controlled. What is left behind is this gunk basically being sold now for $500 a ton. So all the complex molecules are here. How do I understand these complex molecules? It's impossible to get the exact chemical structure. So what I do is I'll say, okay, let me classify this in terms of size. So you can do gel permeation chromatography. It's like a sieve analysis for the molecules in asphalt. You can do acid or base. You can say, okay, how much of this is acidic, basic, amphoteric? Okay, you can classify based on acid or base. You can classify based on polarity. This is by far the most common method. And you can say, okay, I have very polar species and very non-polar species, all these mixed together with intermediate polarity stuff in there. So asphalt, in terms of polarity, has a number of different molecules that have different polarities. But for convenience, we break it down into four boxes. And those four boxes go by the name of SARA. They're saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltines. And those, those boxes are are based on, again on polarity. So uh, we take the asphalt binder, we break it down into these various components, and we use solvent extraction and those kind of things. But here is uh, here is an asphalt binder broken down. So these are the saturates, clear. Okay, these are in solvent. Although uh, if you if you evaporate the solvent, you'll be left with one or two grams. But uh, the solvent is transparent or colorless by definition or to start with, it's a high purity solvent. So you can see the saturates are clear. So this stuff is in our asphalt binder, this clear, transparent, oily stuff, right from these conventional binders we use for road applications. And these are also the least polar, okay? And how do you separate them? They, there's an ASTM procedure and lots of uh, uh, things about it, but if you recall your high school chemistry, that's all I go by with is, if you remember, there was this thing called like dissolves like. So you mix a polar material with a polar material, it will dissolve. You mix a non-polar with non-polar, it will dissolve. You mix a non-polar with polar, it will not dissolve. So what you do, the way you separate all of this is you take solvents of different polarities and you start breaking it down. So you got saturates, aromatics. <coughs> you can see the color gets a little bit darker. These are a little bit more polar than the saturates. Resins, even more polar than the saturates. It gets even darker. And then so you have saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltines. I don't have it in this picture because asphaltine is dark black powder. It's literally a powder. Um, yeah, inadvertently, it got chopped off. Uh, but in, in its at room temperature, it, it's, not, it's not a liquid. All of these, if you evaporate the solvent, these are liquid, heavy oil type of stuff. You can actually, you know, it's very much like a heavy oil that you find in your car engine, so to speak. Uh, asphaltines are, are crisp powder. Okay, so they feel like charcoal dust of some kind. So we have these four fractions. Uh, next step, we dope the original asphalt with one fraction at a time. So I create, so this, if you look at these four fractions, saturates, aromatics, resins, 
<clears throat> they are present in a certain proportion. That proportion is different. These fractions are different for each unique binder, but we have these in different proportions. And what I do is um, I, I take this saturates that I got and put it back in the binder. I spike it with saturates. So I shift the balance. You see this dotted line? This is the original asphalt binder, a nice balance between all four components. I spike it with saturates, make it a little bit more in, you know, I have more saturates in this one. And then I do the same thing with um, asphaltines. I do the same thing with aromatics resin. So I create out of each binder, I create four spiked binders. Those binders could be spiked with saturates, aromatics, resins, asphaltines. Uh, and because I start one parent, four spiked, five, and I have two binders, ten. So <clears throat> just to sort of make it very clear, because this is important for the rest of the story, I have one parent binder, I add saturates, make it saturate spiked. I add to the same binder, I add arom aromatics, make it aromatic spiked. Same binder, I add asphalt resins, I make it resin spiked, asphaltine spiked. So in the slides that come now, when I say asphaltine or saturate or aromatic, I don't mean uh, the component itself, I mean the binder that was spiked with that component. Okay. So we create these. And, and we have five of these, and then for the second binder, we have another five. So we have ten, ten binders to go on. Okay, you start with experiment. Okay, let's measure the rheology of this stuff. You measure the rheology, you get uh, what you have here on the y-axis is the master curve. On the uh, So this, this chart is a master curve. On the y-axis, you have the complex shear modulus, and on the x-axis, you have the frequency. And you can see this was the original binder, the dotted line. And then we had the resins, asphaltines, aromatic saturates. Spike. So uh, what you'd see if you glean these from these results, what you'd see is that if I add less uh, polar stuff such as saturates, the modulus drops down. And so this is aromatics is a little bit more polar than saturates, but even though I'm adding aromatics, the, the, there's still a drop in this uh, G star. And when I add more polar stuff like resins and asphaltines, the stiffness goes up. Okay. Uh, so we see this this nice clean trend with both binders, and that's fine. Uh, in fact, this is something that has been shown in the Sharp era. And if you go back to 1990s reports by WRI, they've done a bunch of these studies and they've shown this uh, over and over again. But <clears throat> I sort of had to do this as an intermediate step and convince myself that this is what it is. So we go to the next step and say, okay. Now, this has been shown. We know that when we add qualitatively, we know we add less polar stuff, it becomes softer. We add more polar stuff, it becomes stiffer. That also makes steps, a sense because polar stuff uh, or these polar molecules that hang around, they are sort of, they, they are like little magnets that tend to sort of stick together and associate with each other and form larger macromolecules that have, have greater rigidity. So you add more of these polar stuff, you get better uh, <coughs> rigidity. So next step was let's quantitatively, instead of qualitatively, let's try to quantitatively figure out what percentage of which fraction makes what difference. So to that end, we tried some rules of mixtures. We went through uh, uh, things like taking volume fractions and component properties. These are very simple rule of mixtures. We tried to use that. Uh, there are some sophisticated models like the Pellierns model that looks at interfacial phenomena, uh, size distribution, and so on and so forth. So we tried some of these models. and and try to evaluate it. So uh, this is what the evaluation looks like. So this is binder, master curve. Again, you have complex modulus versus angular frequency. You have the stiffness of the binder here that is measured, so that's experimental. You have asphaltine. This is also experimental, so this is asphaltine doped binder. And we have uh, a petroline doped binder. So when I say petroline doped binder, I mean that binder has uh, asphalt, uh, all the other three fractions. So other than asphaltine, all other three fractions are put into this and doped into this. So I have this on one end, that on one, another end, and this is the measured bind, binder properties. Now the question was, can I take these properties and that properties and use some kind of a composite model to predict what the binder properties are? Sure enough, you can. These are the two bounds of the uh, uh, composite model, uh, the upper and lower bound. Uh, based on using these numbers, the petrolines and asphaltines, and we are trying to predict what these, what this G star should look like, or what this dotted line, 
uh, or I'm trying to compare these predictions to the measurements over there. So it seems like it's it's working very well, uh, but it's not as robust. Uh, there's still some on a log scale. There's still some falling off at this end. Um, so we're trying to fix that, and I think that's where a little bit of composite modeling helps. This looks small, but it's on a log scale, so it's pretty significant. So let's. So that that was the first part of the journey, rheology. So uh, <clears throat> going back just to quickly recap, I think we have some idea of not just qualitatively saying that when you add these fractions, this is what happens, but also to quantitatively predict these things. Now, if you're wondering, nobody has asphalts that you put asphaltines or petrolines and things like that. That doesn't happen in the real world. That's true. But these are model systems. What does happen in real world is oxidation, for example. Oxidation consumes some of the lower nonpolar fractions and produces more of these, right? So what is an oxidized binder? Oxidized binder is nothing but a binder where this is being consumed and that is being produced. So you can take this knowledge and apply it to what happens to the binder rheology when it oxidizes. What is a recycled asphalt binder mixed with a virgin binder? It's a binder that is rich in this mixed with a binder that is not so rich in that. So you again take these same fundamental ideas and you can start applying it to these, uh, these realistic systems. You took, talk about rejuvenators. How do rejuvenators work? Where do they fall in the spectrum? And how can I predict the modulus of uh, the end product? You talk about other things. You talk about waxes, saturated. So where, where do those things fall in the spectrum? So it's those ideas that although we are not talking about a real system here, but this is knowledge being created out of very clean building blocks that you can then take and understand real systems. <clears throat> By the way, any... Uh, has anybody heard of the phrase called spherical cow? It's probably not. If you have friends in the physics department, you should ask them. Uh, I will tell this, if you have a minute or two, I'll turn towards the end. So until we get to this, so this is the spherical cow of uh, asphalt. So <clears throat> until we get to that, the second part of the journey was towards strength. Stiffness is only one part. Stiffness just tells you if I jump on this, how much is going to deflect. It does not tell me if it's going to break or not. So in the asphalt industry, we've used stiffness as a surrogate for strength for a very long time. That should change. Think about it. Pretty much any other business you go to, uh, asphalt binders are probably the only thing where we do not do a proper strength test. Can you imagine using these bricks without any compressive strength or using the steel in this building without running a tensile strength test? Yet we build billions of dollars of growth without doing actually a proper strength test on asphalt binder. That's an issue and, and things will change and it takes time and we're working on it. But so stiffness is one thing. We'll go to the strength as the other. The experimental tool here was an atomic force microscope. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with an AFM, it's like an, uh, <coughs> it's like an optical microscope, but you are not relying on light bouncing back from the object and your eye seeing it. You're relying on a little sharp needle that feels its way on the surface. So if you imagine that my hand is running over this table and I'm blindfolded, I can sort of, if there are objects on this table, just by feeling or scanning the surface, I can, even with a blindfold, create a map of what is the topography of the surface. And also by feeling the friction between my finger and the surface, I can tell you if this table has something in between that has a different material. Just because now it was rough, now it's smooth, so I can tell you how uh, the different materials are, are existing on this composite. So, uh, think about you taking a sharp needle and trying to imagine what a surface is with blindfolds on. That's what atomic force microscopy is. So you do that and you take an image. You take an image and you see the asphalt binder is no longer this black, sticky, shiny, smooth stuff that you're familiar with. It's got all these structures. In it. Uh, there are many nicknames to these structures. Uh, some of my colleagues call them footballs, others call them bees. Uh, you can call them whatever you want, but they are some kind of structure. It's, it's very clear that they are not homogeneous, right? <clears throat> so that's what the experiment is telling us. So the question then becomes is what are these structures? That is still a debate. There is only circumstantial evidence to say, say that these structures are X or, or Y, uh, but uh, the real answer will come in time. We are still working on that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we, we take a shot at this from the theoretical side and say that, okay, if I have a material, why does it separate? If I have a homogeneous material, why does it separate into these structures? To that end, we go to uh, a phase field model. 
Phase field models were originally developed in the field of metallurgy, where you would mix different metals, and depending on the compatibility of these metals, they would form different structures and so on and so forth. As a very simple example, think of oil and water. You mix oil and water, immediately they will separate into two, right, in a glass if you take that. And if you try to predict the structure formation, it's simple. You have a block of oil, a block of water. Because of the density differences, they will be one on top of the other. The oil will be on the top because it's lighter density. Uh, but now I take oil, water, and add a little bit of soap in it. And I stir it really hard. Now you see some kind of a, a milky liquid that is emulsion. And you take a drop of this liquid under a microscope, you'll see that there are tiny droplets of oil floating around in water. Or with little soap on the on the uh, periphery of this, so of the boundary of these bubbles. So this business of phase field modeling, uh, basically it also goes by, specifically it's called spinoidal decomposition. This is a business where you take these, or try to predict how these structures are formed, or how they decompose, or how a material separates. So when it comes to this phase field modeling, what you do is you start by defining a problem with field variables, uh, and there's a total free energy formulation. Your field variables are basically concentrations. So in this case, I can say that there are saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltenes in certain percentages, and that they are polar. The saturates are the least polar. Asphaltenes are the most polar. And I can uh, assign a total free energy equation. It's based on thermodynamics. And I can give an evolution scheme. And I can give an evolution scheme where I have some parameters that apply certain rules. They say that, OK. The least polar and the most polar, they don't like each other. You try to bring them together, they have a tendency to separate. So if you have A, B, C, D, A and D are not compatible or least compatible with each other. A and B, relatively more compatible. So you can put these rules into this kind of an evolution scheme. Interestingly, in addition to material science, the same kind of evolution scheme is used by uh, people doing genetic studies, population growth, disease spreading, and those kind of things where they put these things in a, in a, in a this formulation and see how it will evolve. Like, you know, how, why populations are these clusters. Um, and, and there are certain rules that you'll say that, you know, people like to live close to each other, but when a cluster becomes too dense, uh, the disease rate goes up, so they break away and you have another new cluster formed somewhere. So it's a very, very interesting area in and off of itself. Uh, I wish I had more time. Sometimes I wish I was a grad student again, had a choice to do a PhD all over again. It would be interesting, more fun. But for now, uh, I worked with a, a, a faculty in chemical engineering. Uh, he happened to be, um, he's, a, he's quite a senior faculty, but at that time when he did his PhD, he worked with a professor from MIT who, were very, who was very, one of the fathers of this whole molecular dynamics uh, system. So there was a great opportunity. And in fact, working with him with this was so much fun. Um, I, I took my student, and so my student and I, we went to the first meeting. Um, and he gave us some papers and some work. We came back, and my job was to assign or delegate this thing to the student. Uh, and when I came back, I was so intrigued. I said, uh, well, you know, why, why don't you go and look at that other stuff in the lab? And I started playing this on the computer myself. Uh, I, I literally stole this little thing uh, from him because it was, it was so exciting. So uh, eventually I made him a part of it. It's not fair. Uh, <laughs> so what you do is you put these four materials together. So the blue color shows that you start with the homogeneous system. And you let the thing separate. Okay. And all these colors here show different polar fractions. The blue is one is the least or one of the polar fractions. The red is a different polar fraction. And you apply these rules and say separate as you will. And the material starts decomposing. If you had only two materials here like oil and water, you would get just a slab of oil here, a slab of oil here, water there. That's it. If you had oil water emulsion, you'll get tiny droplets of oil water emulsion, right? So we put saturates, asphaltines, aromatics, resins, asphaltines in the system, stir it up, and ask thermodynamics to do what it does. Now, to be honest, this is still very, very preliminary. The numbers that I have used for these are not experimental. They're still open for debate. This could still be very much wrong. But uh, it's, it's a good start. Uh, we've, we've played around with these things and we've found some parameters that there are some very unique things in terms of interactions that need to occur for these B-like structures to form. And they are, if you don't have those specific interactions, you don't have these B structures. Even if everything else about this model is wrong, 
that one thing itself is so valuable to me that I found out or I've learned of those specific interactions that give these very weird structures. So if you look at, in, if you see in nature, this kind of this kind of shape or this kind of structure is very unusual. You'll see spheres, you'll see circular structures and all kinds of patterns, but this kind of shape is very unusual. And this modeling, for what it's worth, uh, has parameters that we have guessed, rules that we have sort of empirically imposed, but the structures that come out, we know exactly that there are some interaction parameters here that drive the formation of those shapes and structures. So it's extremely exciting from at least that point of view. So we know, we understand that we have some understanding of how those structures are formed. So uh, of course, this is not a one is to one correlation, but just the idea that you have you know, some similar structures forming. Um, we did this analysis for different uh, systems. So we took the, our control system, we run the analysis there. Oh, here in these two pictures, I've highlighted the non-polars and polars and showing how these things fragment and disperse. Uh, uh, <coughs> we repeated this with the polar spiked. So this is an asphaltine-rich system. We see how these things grow in size and uh, new smaller ones are being formed. And we sort of see something very similar uh, that these, these structures are sort of growing in size. And then we take a non-polar uh, spiked fraction and we see that these structures are now really pushing against each other and growing. We don't see that much growth here, but it's still on an average, the average size of these structures is slightly increased from these. So there is some, again, what I call as circumstantial evidence. It's not a smoking gun. And if I'm a lawyer uh, using this to fight a case, it's still weak evidence. But this is the best I got so far. And I'll continue to work on this. And when I say I, it's just not me. It's a whole team of people, uh, collaborators, not just my institute, uh, all over the world that we are picking each other's brains, talking, collaborating, discussing, and trying to understand this thing better. It, and it, that, that's the part that's most amazing. So the second part of the journey, we, we now have some idea, both experimentally and theoretically, where these structures are coming from and how these structures are formed. So what? So we have these structures. What do they have to do with strength? That's where we get into this portion where we say, OK, now let's take this and do some basic finite element models and try to see what is the stress strain behavior of uh, this kind of a composite. Now we start by using the same sharp needle of an AFM as an indenter. So we poke different portions of this picture and, and get rheological properties. Think of this as nano creep indentation experiments. So we get creep properties from different portions. Uh, these creep compliance curves kind of look like this. Um, again, this is work of uh, two students, Alan Grover and Rizwan Jahangir at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, Professor Dallas Little, who's their advisor, is, uh, kindly let me share my materials and, and ideas and, and work with these two students to kind of run these kind of analyses. So uh, this is some of their work. Uh, but they're using the same materials and same ideas, and we're doing complementary experiments in, in my lab and their lab, uh, so we can join the results together. So uh, you do these experiments, you get these creep uh, properties, and then you use the geometry that you get from an AFM image, you know the material properties, you assign those properties and run a simple tension test. And what you, when you do that, what you see is that when you apply a far field stress, you get local hot spots. You see those uh, red areas? Those are hot spots where even if you have a unit stress here, the local stress is about three to five times higher or multiplied compared to the far field stress. So you get a 3x to 5x amplification at these hot spots and that's where we think damage occurs. Uh, so we come up with this hypothesis and say, okay, failure is concentrated in regions of high stress. We say that, okay, this is probably where failure starts. Now again, just because it's high stress doesn't mean that's where failure starts. Maybe it's high stress, but also stronger. We don't know, but that's uh, a hypothesis we propose and test it. Uh, <clears throat> the second hypothesis, we say that if you have more of these structures, okay, if you have more of these structures and smaller structures, you have a better distribution of stress, which means these hot spots are not 3x, but maybe only 1 and half x, but more distributed throughout the material. So you don't have very high local amplification, but more of a distributed amplification. So we take those two hypotheses and run experiments on <clears throat> an AFM to try it out. So this was a mold we prepared, and we shipped it to Rezvan. Uh, with some binder and said, would you stick this when you're running your tests under a microscope? And see. It's a simple strain device. What you do is you have a binder film here. You apply a constant strain. 
Uh, and once you apply the strain, you let the binder relax all the stresses, you go back and image it. Once you go back and image it, you'd see that uh, this is under no load condition after 1% strain, after 3% strain, you'd see that these features start developing. Uh, Rizwan jumps and says there are cracks. I say, okay, no, we don't know if there are cracks. There's some kind of a discontinuity. So we, then we talked to Dallas, he said, their cracks, maybe discontinuity. So we negotiated and we called it a fancy name. We call it uh, load-induced phase separation or lips or something like that. We don't know what it is. Probably <laughs> it's in a draft manuscript somewhere. But we know that some of these ambiguities start. But the interesting part is these ambiguities start the exact same place where we thought they would start, where we said that you know you have these stress concentrations right next to these boundaries, and that's where you see these disambiguities uh, begin. Uh, and, and you can verify that using a finite element simulation. So if you take that same geometry, run the simulation again, you will see that these are the, these red locations are locations where you have stress amplification taking place. And those are also the same places where you have these discontinuities occur. Uh, so that was the first hypothesis. Seems like I give myself a check mark, but uh, you know, it's still carefully treading on whatever evidence we have. The second hypothesis which was more, <clears throat> more of these structures, you get less stress amplification, more dispersion, and therefore higher tensile strength. So we try this with the poker chip test. Now poker chip test is, is this, like I said, the sandwich based test. You can, uh, you can conduct this test in load control, displacement control mode. You can take the results, unify it. Uh, these are results from, uh, these are basically on the, on the x-axis you have a damage parameter here, you have stiffness. And you can see the results can be unified using proper theories. You have results from uh, three different loading rates, two different displacement rates, uh, and you can you can see that the damage behavior is uniform. So, so it's it's a material test independent of the mode of testing, and it's also very repeatable. Uh, you've tried different aspect ratios. If you discount for the uh, confining effects and you correctly account for, not discount for, correctly account for the confining stresses, you'll see that the true vertical stress is almost constant as long as your aspect ratio is 40 or higher. That means your diameter to film thickness ratio is 40 or higher. You get very consistent results. Uh, if you have a, a thicker film, if you go from these 40 to lower aspect ratios, that means you have thicker film, you don't get as much confinement. So what you get here is not fracture but flow. So you transition from fracture to flow. So we've done that. Uh, over here we see crack nucleation, cavitation, uh, transition from cavitation to flow type behavior, so on and so forth. It's a sensitive test, but it's repeatable. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and this is just to show the repeatability of the test. So, but these are the results. Now, uh, the blue is one binder and its derivatives. The red or orange is the other binder and its derivatives. So you have the control here. We know that the stiffness decreases as you add less polar material. Stiffness increases as you add more polar stuff. But this has to do with strength. So if you look at the strength, it's the same thing happening. You have less polar material, the strength is decreasing. You add more polar material, the strength is increasing. And the change is different for different systems, but it's very, very consistent for both binders. Okay? Think of this, again, this is a very clean system, building blocks, idealized, so on and so forth. But think of this from a practical viewpoint. We talk about RAP and RAS, for example, or RAP. Uh, RAS is a slightly more different beast, but RAP, recycled asphalt, right? We say that recycled asphalt will lead to more cracking. Recycled asphalt increases stiffness, but it also increases strength. So it's not, we shouldn't be jumping to conclusions saying you add more RAP, you get more cracking, but rather we should be thinking that, okay, if I add more RAP, I'm increasing stiffness of the system, but I'm also slightly increasing the strength. So it can take a little bit more before it cracks. So the question is, how do you balance the two? And that is what where we need to kind of understand and see where, where the stiffness and strength balance out each other. Uh, so we take that and, and we, try comp we try to explain this using composite theories. We cannot because the weak link is still there in significant proportions. So failure will occur at the weak link. So it's nothing to do with composite. Uh, and what we, what we think here is what is happening is that the microstructure is important. So this ties to our second hypothesis is that for saturates you have these large structures for 
these polar stuff, you have these dispersed structures, and sure enough, if you run a finite element analysis, so forth, you'll see that you have much higher stress concentration here, and much lower and more distributed stress concentration here in these kind of systems. So this result kind of show, supports the second hypothesis, and uh, also these are pictures of the idea of crack uh, nucleation in the form of cavitation. So this is something that is an area of work we are still looking at, but what you see here are from that poker chip test, these are failure planes. So if you take the poker chip test and look at the asphalt, these are the failure planes you see. For the same set of conditions, you see how different this failure plane is compared to this failure plane. Now these little craters that you see are referred to as cavitations or cavities. These are sites where cracks are born and then they grow and they grow and coalesce with other cracks and form bigger cracks. But if you compare these three systems, you'll see that there are many more sites here and very few sites here and, and you know the only difference is composition as you go from this scale to that scale. Now I'm jumping length scales. I'm talking about something that's microscopic here. This, this whole square must be just a few microns, about 10 microns by 10 microns, and here I'm talking about 10,000 microns. So I'm jumping scales, but it's the same idea, same trend. So it's a little too early to connect the two, but again, we have some circumstantial evidence to show that the two may be connected. Uh, this could also be a stiffness issue. Uh, maybe this is just soft, so it has more cavities. Nothing to do with asphaltine or um, saturates or anything. So we go back and actually try to run this at higher rates of loading to artificially increase the stiffness and try those kind of things. So and it, it shows that that's that's not the case. So so there are things that we're working on here to try to connect and understand where these cracks are born and how do they grow, and what is that what does that have to do with the microstructure? So putting it all together. Now, what do we do with all of this information? This is where a library comes in. So my thinking right now, or one of our goals of what we're trying to do is to come up with a library. If we have these fingerprints of different asphalt binders, different additives, and if we have a good understanding, both theoretical, uh, validated with proper experiments, and cycled through, so you go through these cycles of theory and experiment, once we have each one of these modules fit together, and we have a good library of fingerprints of these materials, uh, then slowly we won't need experiments anymore. And I'm saying that loosely. We will need experiments to sort of validate. But in the grand scheme of things, if I have, say, four different binders or three different additives, and I know that this system works, I can run all the permutations on my computer and then go and try a few things in the lab. Uh, think of pharmaceutical industry. How do they design drugs? They don't think of 14 formulations and get 1,400 lab rats to test it on. They think of 14 combinations. They run computer simulations on those 14 formulations, select two, and then get lab rats for two combinations. And that's the kind of thinking that we ought to be thinking about is that in this open-ended problems where you have n number of asphalt binders with n number of different chemical fingerprints with all the options of additives and anti-strips and warm mix and recycled, with all these variables floating around, it's, it's impossible or very difficult or very expensive to do like a full matrix if you want to optimize or if you want to figure out what's the best rejuvenator, what's the best uh, system, what's the best binder with this binder, whether this wrap will work with that wrap or that binder or not. It's a very, very large field to work with. So that's where modeling helps, is that you can reduce that field to a few select combinations and then go after those uh, combinations with experimental work. So uh, concluding thoughts, first is we can take these ideas, we can take this knowledge, go to the refinery and say, hey, you're blending crude stocks all the time. I talked to a particular refinery <clears throat> about one and a half year ago talking about these same ideas. They said, uh, we, this is all good, we don't really need it because our operator knows exactly where the crude oil is coming from. He knows exactly what button to push, what dial to turn, what temperature, what pressure. He turns and does this, all this, and we get a PG58 minus 28 outside, and he knows exactly what to do to adjust that. Six months later, the same refinery, I asked him that, will you be please willing to share some of this data? The same person said, uh, you know what, it's a problem because our management has decided to buy crude oil from wherever it is cheap. So today it is cheap from Canada, so we'll get this Canadian crude. The Canadian crude is a mix of 18 different crude stocks because they refine all over, they pump it into one pipeline, so it's getting all mixed up. 
uh, tomorrow it's cheap from Venezuela. So now all of a sudden you have this moving target problem. So this kind of thing becomes extremely helpful. Uh, okay, even if you're not talking about refinery, we're talking about post-production, you're talking about chemical modifiers, you're talking about polymer modifiers. Which modifiers work with which systems and why and how? You're talking about chemical additives such as warm mix additives. Uh, you know, what do these additives do and how do they work? And what are they doing to the binder chemistry? You're talking about things like rejuvenators. Okay, let's add this magic oil and boom, you can go from 20% to 50% wrap. Why? And will this magic oil work for every single binder that I get from every single refinery? Or in fact, will it work with the same binder from the same refinery if it comes two weeks later? We've had this in real projects and you must have seen this too. You get a sample from a producer, it's of 64 minus 28. Uh, you test it, it gives one property, two months, two, week, two weeks later you get another sample, it's very different. It's still a 64 minus 22 or 28, but now it's performing very differently. Why? You call the refinery, the producer, they said, well, yeah, we changed the crude stuff. So if you have a formula that you know works with wrap, rejuvenator, whatever, do you, can you guarantee that, that will it work? So we need good tests. And we need more than one test. Yes, the DOTs and federal highways will say that find one test where with a push of a button it will tell me everything about all the binders. That's an ideal world we should hope for, but uh, you cannot get one size fits all approach. Maybe it's not a bad idea to get two tests, two models. I borrow from Nelson Gibson from Federal Highway an interesting example which I find is very appropriate. He says, if you look at climate prediction models, people don't use one model and say, this model is going to predict the weather to be this much. There are a number of models. Some models are better at some times and other models are better at other times. The NOAA is running several different climate models simultaneously and making predictions. So uh, one model says there is a 70% chance it's going to snow and the other model says there's a 50% chance. The third one says it's a 90% chance. In either case, we better be prepared. But uh, so uh, there is room for multiple tests. There is room for multiple models. If nothing else, at least for redundancy. You know, if, if you have one test that says this is everything, am I going to bet million dollars or $10 million worth of construction project on just that one test? Why not spend uh, a, a couple of thousand extra dollars and do two other tests or models if we can? So we need to break away from the thought and thinking that this is one perfect tool. The numbering got messed up or maybe it is because I think both are just equally important and I couldn't number it. So the library of crude stocks and assays and modifiers, if we have a library we can run these material designs, material engineering on computers and then try it out in labs, something that pharmaceutical industry does. Uh, efficient integration of models. We can use these ideas to explain why certain modifiers are more effective than others. We can help optimize modification costs without compromising quality. Do we really need 2% SBS or can we use just half percent for this particular binder because it's not going to make any difference anyway and reduce the cost of the project. Uh, and most importantly to discover uh, new material combinations. Collaborators in no particular order. Uh, in fact, I think if there is an order, then I should put the students first. Uh, Sharman and Pravath uh, are former PhD students uh, who were in, at my, with, working with me. Uh, Sakib is current PhD student working with me. Marcus is, uh, believe it or not, he's an undergraduate student, but uh, to me, he's like a graduate student. He's, 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 his excitement and the level of intrigue and the amount of highlights Every paper I throw at him, the number of highlights he comes back with is, is just amazing. I just keep ramping up. Now I'm showing, throwing Shapri's reports at him and he's still coming back and asking me questions. So uh, it's an amazing guy there. Uh, Rizwan and Grover are former PhD. So Rizwan is finishing up. Grover has finished his PhD. Uh, both working on the supervision of Dallas Little. I was a, a adjacent supervisor from a neighboring institute. Uh, and then my collaborators, Professor Ganeshan and uh, Ken Lichty from UT, uh, Professor Scarpus and Alexander Schmetz, we, we, we are continuously talking about this. Uh, I was having a long discussion about all of this modeling effort, face field modeling and so forth with them a couple of weeks ago. 
Friday afternoon again probably I'm going to have another chat with Alexander and uh, Dr. Massad, Dallas Little and Ilaria Menapes is, uh, is a postdoc working at Texas A&M Qatar so they're all been extremely helpful and that was my concluding slide. I just conclude by saying this phrase by Richard Feynman who said that uh, a, no matter, it's, it's not that A is made of B or vice versa, all mass is interaction and, and I think it's true in our academic environment also uh, thank you for being, bringing me here. Thank you for letting me interact with you because our research is also interaction and it's not this report or that report or this paper or that paper. Interaction is uh, just as in materials. I think in research interaction is extremely important. I'll take questions and if you have a minute, I'll tell you the story of the spherical cow afterwards. Thank you. Questions? Um, thank you, Professor. Really enjoyed the presentation. <coughs> I have a couple of questions. I hope to have time. Uh, you, you will have time that I can catch you after the uh, presentation. But Absolutely. first, uh, comparing the results from DSR and the tensile strengths, I noticed that for the DSR, first it was asphaltene, then controlled, mm -hmm. then the other parts. But for the strengths, it was as it was saturates. Uh, sorry, it was asphaltene, then resin, then control. No, so right. resin suddenly passes the control for the uh, no, the same order. Same order if I'm not mistaken. Let me just quickly do it. Um, so control is in between yeah. the two polars on this side, the two non-polars on this side, or less polars on this side, right? Yeah. Uh, I think DSR also is the same way. If I can go back to that. Okay. I'm clicking very fast, but it registers only one click. Okay, there you go. No, this is the petrol link. Yeah, this one. So okay, yeah, right. control in the middle, the two relatively more polar on the top, two relatively, so it's still in the middle. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it crosses the boundaries, for that matter. What's the next? Are you going to study the aging and the... Uh, modification to? Uh, yes. Uh, we are at the moment, like I said, this is not a project, this is an idea <coughs> feeding off of a research project. So at the moment we have a little study going on with the Texas Department of Transportation where some of their binders have failed prematurely in the field, although they passed the PG spec. Uh, it has something to do with a very infamous PPA or REOPS and things like that. So we are doing a study with them, um, evaluating a number of binders. So we're trying to see if we can bring some of this kind of information from the binders that we're testing from them into this database, into this pool. Um, maybe if we get a chance, we include rejuvenators or recycled as well, as, as an entire opportunity for this. Uh, quick question. The, uh, the poker chip one, is that a pull or a push? It's a pull. It's a pull. We do push for creep measurements, Poisson's ratio measurements, uh, and just a tiny push, but most uh, for the tensile strength. Cool. So, you mentioned at the beginning uh, push-pull test. Is there maybe in your presentation? Yes, yes. Um, can you tell me what, what you guys are using that test for and basically the kind of results you're seeing from that? Um, the push-pull was actually not uh, the mixture test. It was, I think it was, yes. yes. Yeah, that's an AMPT. That's actually, uh, in fact, maybe I should have said it more clearly. This is not, we did not do this. Nelson Gibson did this at okay. Federal High He did all this. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to avoid the mixture of hard work associated with mixture. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, he did this and I said, okay, can I do the same thing with less resources and get to the same conclusion? But this test, just for the, uh, this is the, um, this is Nelson Gibson used the viscoelastic continuum damage model with the fatigue damage test and the CNS parameter. So this is all of that. Richard Kim, basically Professor Kim's uh, work that he developed over the years on, on viscoelastic continuum damage model that is being put into this with this test method. Uh, our test also uses the same model that he has uh, and we've integrated since then healing and fatigue in the same test. So you don't run a sample for fatigue, a sample for healing, you use the same test to get healing fatigue. But the theory is the same as Professor. Okay. Uh, 
I think he's questioned because he's having a little higher coefficient of variation on this test. So, oh, yeah. This one? I yeah, the test push 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 push. Yeah. Uh, my next question would have been, what's if you had run the test, what's your variability? Uh, this one, I can tell you, is very good. <laughs> it's not much. The yeah, binary yeah, yeah. But, but because it's also very fine mixed and very homogeneous. Uh, but but I understand uh, that you need to actually normalize some of the initial differences because small variations in the M value or small variations in the initial compliance will make a lot of difference. So uh, you have to normalize and use the correct normalization. I can share with you uh, a dissertation using this, but it addresses the variability question associated with this. Question. Uh, uh, Pace diagram, mm -hmm. those B shapes earlier, uh, literature says that you are representing the asphaltene, but based on your polarity chart that I noticed, uh, they are not, uh, apparently. You didn't um, comment on this part, which part is asphaltene, which part is not. So I'll go back to the last slide that let us not worry about what is what, <laughs> it's all interaction. Yes. Uh, there is literature that says that is asphaltene. There's also literature that says that is wax. There's also literature that says there's saturated. It's a big point of debate. In fact, tomorrow afternoon with Alexander Schmitz, uh, that's the conference call I'm going to have, is that uh, not to solve the debate, but to think about how we can address this debate. And it's a good thing to have that kind of question. So what those structures are chemically, I think they are a mix. They are not pure asphaltenes. They are not pure saturates. They are not pure waxes. And the reason for that, they are a mix of everything with slightly higher concentrations of asphaltines may all saturates one or the other. But they are not exclusively one phase. And I can tell you why they are not exclusively one phase very quickly. Uh, if, if you just recall the slide, you look at the G star values, you see how asphaltines are at least two orders of magnitude or an order of magnitude stiffer than the other guys. And if you remember the nano indentation pre compliance, you don't see order of magnitude difference. You see 2x, 3x, 5x difference. So if it is pure this or pure that, you will see at least one, two order magnitude difference. That you don't see. And nobody's seen that kind of difference, uh, either us or any other research group that I'm aware of. So it, it's not exclusively this or that. It's probably a mix of everything with slightly higher proportions of this and slightly higher proportions of that. What is this and that is still up for debate. Uh, so nowadays we are using a lot of recycled materials and uh, we are proposing to add rejuvenators or which can soften the binder, oxidized binder. But as you said that, uh, like the, uh, it, my question is like, is there in a proper way to mix that rejuvenator or that additional, you know, additive to the binder? Because we generally add the rejuvenator on site in the mixture. Mm -hmm. It's not mixed with the binder. So here we are doing it with the binder. Yeah. So it's I think it's different from the mixture level stuff. And yeah. at the end of the day, when we are doing practical stuff, that's true. Let's say hot yeah. in place recycling. We are directly putting a rejuvenator on the top of your mixture. Then how will we compare if we need to study oh, okay. what is the effect of So there are two things that can happen in a real scenario. Let's say you go mix this rejuvenator in a drum mix back, you throw it in the rest of the stuff, you mix and it comes out, right? There are two scenarios. One extreme is that because of the high temperatures and transportation and, and mechanical forces it's being subjected to, everything blends. So although you're not mixing it in a stirrer, uh, the process of carrying it from one place to another, the temperatures that you're putting at 150, 140 degrees Celsius, so very high temperatures which promote diffusion and, and mixing. So that's one scenario. If that is the scenario, then you are here. The other scenario is that the temperatures and times associated are not sufficient for full mixing to others. Right? In that case, now you're dealing with a very complex composite where you have a binder, where you have a, a rejuvenator somewhere in the middle, and then you have the rack. Right? So this is now a three component adhesive layer, and you've got to then think that in this system, where's the weak link? So now instead of one problem, I have three problems. And I need to figure out which one is the most urgent one. Where is that failure would happen? Um, there's another paper. Well, it's not a paper yet because the draft is in my uh, But if you're looking at um, these diffusion times, 
and looking at how much time and it takes for the material to diffuse and mix with recycled material in the absence of rejuvenator is something we've tried and something that you should do. So those, those are important questions. In fact, uh, what happens if you mix the rejuvenator with the wrapped stockpile and leave it there for a day or two and then mix it with the binder? You allow it to marinate just as you would do with you know, active today. Yes, sir. I, I think this is this is very very important uh, issue because if you look at the Korea or the oil patterns, uh, a lot of the problem in in Canada is because of that. And you don't see this problem when you are doing the mixes. You do it after a year or two in the field. So the problem is sometimes it's not something that we can detect uh, easily. I mean, yeah. with these kind of mixes, this is this is a major issue. The same. Like uh, a double ABT uh, LSU were presenting yeah. some work where they were saying that if you add rejuvenators to, to RAS, uh, this will make it worse. But then if you are adding some polymer, then that will improve it again. So all these kind of things is just some immediate measurements that might not tell me what kind of separations going to happen later on. And if I may add actually one layer of complexity to this, uh, I was talking to Professor Jeff this morning and he mentioned that there's a cold wave that we're working on and he's working on and he mentioned dolomite aggregates and I saw some samples on his desk and uh, that had wrapped in Portland Center concrete and if you look at those dolomite and this is a problem in Texas, the reason why we have the Texas study is, is, is this is probably what's happening in Texas. But again, it's a hypothesis at this point, so we're going to see how it works. Is some of these aggregates like dolomites and limestone, they're absorptive. And so when they absorb, they act as a sieve. They act as a sponge to actually suck up some fractions from the asphalt binder and leave the others. In fact, if you go to his desk and see those wrap samples, you can very clearly see that there's an aggregate, and there's a halo around that aggregate of absorbed binder. This is from a wrap particle that was cut in that specimen. And on that cut, you will see that there is a halo of absorbed binder. So I'm willing to bet that not all the binder was absorbed. There are only some fractions that went in and others left behind. So my, the question is, which one of these fractions got left behind and what are their characteristics? Where is the weakness? So that, I mean, those are really, especially for porous aggregation, that's a big problem. It, I, I, and that's my working hypothesis with Techstar at the moment, especially because we've got limestone and porous limestone that act as sponge. In fact, Shell developed a spot test to, to verify and look at that. We have uh, two questions from the online audience. Okay. Um, VK would like to know, in your work, did you use the same percent increase in various components, the Sarah components? Yes. Or did you add the same amounts of these components? Same percent increase. Percents. Same relative percent increase. So, I hope you can hear me as well. Yes. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, so it was the same relative percent increase. It was always 30% relative to what it was. So if I had 15% of a fraction, then I went 15 times 1.3, and all other fractions were relatively reduced by similar amounts. So it was the same relative percent. Yeah. Second question, uh, what info do you plan to collect on all the available binders for creating this library? Um, that I have a wish list of uh, at least <laughs> fractions and things like that, but it is also very the, But my wish list is extremely resource intensive, so it's a question of time and resources on how and best we can. Ideally, I would like to co collect assay information as a minimum. What percentage SARA fractions are in each binder? As a minimum, like what are the saturates, aromatics, resins, asphaltines? But the saturates are also different. The saturates from uh, uh, Boscan crude is very different from saturated from another crude, so if I can collect a library of these samples also. Eventually, I think if we have enough data, uh, we will we will start seeing patterns emerge. Uh, NIST, again, is, is an inspiration. I was, again, talking from this conversation this morning. NIST, 20 years ago, they developed a library of all these um, virtual molecules and systems and microstructures, and if you want to do a research now, um, that's what he said. He said, we don't go to experiment. We can actually download from NIST's library these structures and uh, try out what happens if I put titanium here or something here and then go to experimental work. So I'm hoping in another 20 years, <laughs> that is also being ambitious, we'll also have a library of that kind if, if we just 
Yeah. But who knows? <laughs> Microstructure. microstructure evolution part uh, you, you think expanding the work on and how that co eventually comes into the, the microstructure is a very important part of that path mm -hmm. so I think we have room to improve the phase field model uh, we are now uh, I'm collaborating with the professor in physics uh, professor Michael Downer his name is not here but I think I should mention it uh, he's, he specializes in optics so he He's able to look at real-time changes in these microstructures as a function of temperature. So we look at these structures appear and disappear as you change the, the temperature thermostat on the specimen. And it's and then what we've done is uh, we've taken this same thermal history that he's applied and applied it to the asphalt binder in a rheometer. Putting it very simply, if you if if you can try this in a DSR test, if you find something different or something amazing, let me know if you try this in on the way. I'm not um, I'm not adding extra work, but if you do something, <laughs> Professor Rukhani is looking at me and so, uh, but, uh, but if you are, as you heat the binder and then you cool it back, okay? Look at the difference in G star. It's up to 30% difference of the modulus as you go from 58, 64, 70, 76 versus 76, 70, uh, not 58, you'll see the differences at lower end. So you see you go from 15, 20, 25, so we've done the 15, 20, 25, 30, and about 20, 25 degrees Celsius as you're going up versus coming down, there's almost a 30% difference in G star. 30%. We've done this over and over again. And we've looked at normal course, we've looked at the stuck thermocouples, we tried every oxidation, everything. We looked at all these possibilities, but there's only one thing at the moment that we see is when Mike Downer's student does this on a plate, these structures seem to peak at the same, very similar temperature as our rheology measurements and disappear on the way back. They, they show up on the way up, they disappear on the way back. And on rheology, we see these things, the stiffness go higher on the way up, lower on the way back. You go back up again, it's higher. Again, so it's... It's still in notes, this is still work in progress, but I just can't seem to shut up about these things. So. <laughs> it's very interesting. If you see something, if you're running a DSR experiment, uh, and you have, you can, if you can program it to run from 20 degrees and go up and come down in just one cycle, uh, see what you find. You'll see that there is there are huge difference, and that difference is 20, 30, 35% depending on the type of binder and thermal history. But, uh, that sounds great. We would like to thank you again for this uh, really uh, my, my provoking, I guess. Uh, <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the opportunity.